Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. Welcome to another roundtable discussion of the Doctrine and Covenants. Today we have gathered with us professors from the Department of Church History of Doctrine at Brigham Young University. We welcome Craig Mansell. Welcome, Craig. Thank you. It's nice to have you here. Randy Bott. It's good to be with you again, Matthew. It's good to have you here, Randy. And Richard Cowan. It's a privilege for me to be with you. Well, welcome, Richard. And I'm Matthew Richardson, Associate Dean of Religious Education. Today we will begin our study of the Doctrine and Covenants in section 84. And brethren, to tell you the truth, section 84 in and of itself is mm -hmm. quite a load to be able to, to study here. So many wonderful insights, mm -hmm. framing doctrines. It's, it's a beautiful experience, but uh, we have a, a, quite a task before us. Before we jump into the, the revelation itself, Richard, would you mind at least letting, letting us know how we might frame this according to what's happening in 1832 and then Maybe, Craig, you can jump in right after and frame some of the thoughts as, as far as specific to Section 84 and its outline, et cetera. Richard? Well, some recent sections that we've been talking about have called Brethren on Missions. And here we have Brethren returning from a mission. And in effect, I guess they are returning rejoicing, and the prophet says to them, let me just uh, put your service into perspective. And this revelation does that for them. Yeah, this is a marvelous opportunity for these. It's sort of like a, uh, a reporting of their mission. These elders are coming back. Joseph says, well, let's talk about the grand picture. You've been converting souls to the kingdom of God. They're going to come to Zion. Let's talk about it, it, a holistic look at that. I think we, could, we begin by looking in section 38 when the Lord asks the saints to gather out of Babylon and to come to Kirtland and to gather for certain reasons. This concept of gathering is sort of the beginning of what's going on in section 84. We're going to gather. One reason important for section 38 says to be taught from on high. I'm going to give you ordinances in my house and information that you might see my face, uh, see the face of God. And so the, we gather together then to protect each other, to, to learn of his word, and to teach. And that's what's starting out in, in verse 2 here, right. is this concept. Well, let's, why don't you read verse 2? Let's look at verse 2, because I, I like this, because it's almost, it says, here is the purpose of the church, the reason for the church. Craig, we read? Yea, the word of the Lord concerning his church established in the last days for the restoration of his people, as he has spoken by the mouth of his prophets, and for the gathering of his saints to stand upon Mount Zion, which shall be the city of New Jerusalem. In other words, Jackson County, Missouri. And I think that's important. So there is an establishment of, the, of this location and, and the principle of gathering therewith. Now, gathering is not just simply sending out invitations, everybody, let's go. There is a, uh, an order. There is a power. As a matter of fact, in, in the power of gathering, look at verse 3. I, I love this part about building the notion of Mount Zion. Which city shall be built beginning at the temple lot? And, and so here we see the concept of temple with Zion, which we cannot escape. Uh, where you find Zion, you find temple, and where you find temple, you will find priesthood. But it isn't just the association. What's the center? That's right. The, the, the very center is the temple. That's right. Well, verse 4, Verily this is the word of the Lord, that the city of the new Jerusalem shall be built by gathering the saints, beginning at this place, even the place of the temple, which temple shall be reared in this generation. So the idea in section 57, when Joseph Smith uh, acknowledged where that was going to be and that this was this land, and then he puts his temple in the midst of his people, like the children of Israel, the temple was in the midst. He's within the temple, and his law is within the temple. And therefore, it's, the, it's where salvation is gained was within the temple. He wants us to have that, and we must gather towards it and go into it to obtain salvation. Has that philosophy changed today, brothers? No, the, the no. modern day prophets are saying over and over again, keep Christ the center of your focus, your center of your lives, over and over again. If we do that, 
uh, then we are a Zion people. True. And, and even in the concept of temple building today, Richard, I know you've had a little bit of experience with temples <laughs> in the church. And uh, Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I'm just thinking of what President Hunter emphasized during his brief nine-month presidency that focused our attention to make the temple the great symbol of our faith. Good. And as we see the spreading forth of Zion within, within the world, we see the spreading forth of temples. And what, what a wonderful template this, this literally is. Well, we, we see this coming forth with the, the building of the temple. And once again, we then almost, and I don't think it's a jump or let's shift gears, but, but maybe um, um, being able to f fill, um, to, to be able to round out from temple, now we start talking about priesthood. Natural mm -hmm. fit there. Any, any thoughts on that one? That the priesthood, as he outlines here, not only has a responsibility, like in verse 19, uh, of administering the gospel, but it, it is the key by which we gain access to the mysteries of the kingdom, even the knowledge of God, which I interpret to be uh, not only the knowledge about what God is like, which to know is eternal life, but also the knowledge which God has. And if we're going to make a success of our marriages and our families, then we're going to have to do it by tapping into this unlimited resource of priesthood power. You know, it's nice here, we see, you mentioned the key of the greater priesthood, verse 19. This seems to be a section where the Melchizedek priesthood does have some discussion, um, where we get an opportunity to talk about the, the great power and how the appendages work within that Melchizedek priesthood. Greg? Yeah, see, the priest is what functions within the temple, and it's, it's there that we, the Aaronic priesthood is manifested, the Melchizedek priesthood, the higher ordinances of the gospel are found within there. Now, the Lord wants to tell us that this is an important requirement for us to have had, but he also reminds us in verses uh, 6 through, he's talking about the history of Moses and how they lost the priesthood, you see, and as it goes through. He doesn't want that to happen to us or to th us in this dispensation. You know, it's interesting that he says in the ordinances of this higher or greater priesthood, uh, the power of godliness is manifest, and without the ordinances and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. For without this, which I assume would be the ordinances and the authority of the priesthood, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. And yet the only ordinance that's ne absolutely necessary for exaltation uh, that's outside of the temple is the bestowal of the Holy Ghost. So you're and, reading from verses 20 through 22, correct? Yes. Okay. And, and so everything other than that, other, all of the other ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood are found, are housed within the sacred temples. Good. And the instruction, the endowment is designed to teach us the mysteries of godliness, to use the scriptural phrase. Good. And, and it's interesting here, the invitation to embrace the godliness and to know those mysteries, which often is defined as truth that can only be known through revelation. Yes. But, but look, at, look at our responsibility here. For Moses, verse 23, taught this. Verse 24, but they hardened their hearts and could not endure his presence. Therefore, the Lord in his wrath, his anger was kindled against them, swore that they should not enter into a rest, etc. And the sad part is they lose that, that, that company of the priesthood and the purpose therewith, at least the, the higher priesthood in verse 25. Well, Moses is the one who has the keys. That's He's right. He's the president of the church. When you take him out of the midst of the people, what you took out was the ordinances of salvation at that time. This is a devastating thing for the children of Israel. Well, why? Because they've disobeyed. In a sense, that's what's happened. Go over in verse 5. It's what's happened that the, the saints in Missouri didn't build the temple there for various reasons, which we learn later on in some sections. But they have failed in that essence. And the Lord wants to say, don't fail me in this dispensation. Uh, I, we need to establish our house and my presence there and his ordinances. I wonder in our modern day setting, if we put a sufficient emphasis on what the objective of each father in the home would be concerning his wife and his children, that because the, the, uh, Moses did all of the things that he did with the ordinance of the priesthood for the specific purpose of bringing the people, the children of Israel, into the presence of God. Yeah. And, and I think unless we focus that as one of our emphasis, not necessarily that we have to have him come and join us for family home evening, but that we would be worthy upon uh, opportunity and, and call to go into the presence of God. 
Well, it seems very clear that that priesthood responsibility is to bring individuals to the church, but to the ordinances as well, to the Savior. Mm -hmm. You would know this, Randy, better perhaps than I. You're dealing with missionary work, but it seems the, the, the constant emphasis of we are not trying to simply gain convert baptisms, yeah. bring them to the font, as they would say, but bring them to the temple, bring them to, to the higher ordinances of Melchizedek priesthood. What a, what a beautiful concept that is. In fact, when, uh, when I was serving as a mission president, uh, Elder David B. Haight came and he said, I've suggested to the brethren that we not count them as convert baptisms or converts to the church until they have been through the temple. Oh, that's interesting. We didn't get very far, but I think that that was a <laughs> suggestion there. Well, in our discussion about Melchizedek priesthood, then starting in verse 26, then we start to talk about a lesser priesthood. Now, now of course, Joseph taught um, that all priesthood is Melchizedek, but that there are different portions or degrees of it. What, what's your thought or insight here, starting in 26, when we start to talk about lesser priesthood, it's almost a revisitation in some ways of section 13 of keys of ministering of angels, preparatory gospel. Well, this is what he left in their midst when uh, uh, Moses is taken out, is the preparatory priesthood, the ironic. And in a sense, it's really DNC section 13 being talking about the keys, the ministering of angels and the preparatory gospel. That was what was left for them. Uh, and so this is an, uh, that's what's going to move forward. It's also uh, the Aaronic priesthood is manifest in the temple today, but it's, it's a step to the Melchizedek priesthood. And this is what they were left with. But, but isn't it interesting that in verse 24, the Lord, he says his wrath was, uh, the, the, therefore the Lord in his wrath for his anger was kindled against him, still did not take everything away That's from right. him. Mm -hmm. He still left him with the ability to have the ministry of angels and the preparatory gospel. I can't get away from this whenever I read the Doctrine and Covenants is it seems to me there's a great desire of the Savior to save us, constantly finding ways to provide a means if we will not harden our hearts to save us. It's amazing. Richard? You know, the ministry of angels isn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, most of us would be very pleased if we were to have an angelic ministrant. Of course, uh, I think many of us have heard uh, recent general authorities talk about how the word angel could mean uh, anyone who is delegated to carry a message. That was Elder Oaks speaking yes. about that. That was an insightful. But uh, insightful. it's interesting though that as great as the ministry of angels is, that we need to contrast that with uh, verses 19 through uh, 21 that's talking about the Melchizedek priesthood uh, having the key to bring us into the presence of God. Very good. So yes. as wonderful as uh, these messengers from God are. Well what, what the Aaronic priesthood is is verse 27 looking at it in comparison to what you're saying, Richard, in the Melchizedek. The Aaronic priesthood, which gospel, uh, meaning the mission of the Aaronic, is the gospel of repentance and of baptism. Well, that's what the Aaronic priesthood does. You know, baptism, mm -hmm. the, bishop of the, uh, the office of the bishop in remission of sins, uh, repentance, baptism, the remission of sins, and the law of carnal commandments, which the Lord in his wrath caused to continue with the house of Aaron. And so that's, what it, that's what's there. But that's, if we leave it at that, well, we don't have exaltation. That's and, right. and he doesn't leave it at that. That's the beauty of this because, for example, look at the way they, they take this. We've had a little bit of a history and background of Melchizedek priesthood. Then we had this experience with Aaronic priesthood. Then we come to verse 33 and it says this, for whoso is faithful unto the obtaining of these two, two priesthoods, priesthoods of which I have spoken and the magnifying of their calling are sanctified by the Spirit unto the renewing of their bodies and they become, and then we start to come down into what most people refer to as the oath and covenant of the priesthood. Well, what's your thought on, on, when we say oath and covenant of priesthood, that in and of itself is a topic worthy of lengthy discussion, but, but there are some things here that we could frame that I think are very wonderfully um, important to, to all partakers of priesthood, not just those who bear priesthood or use priesthood, for we are all users of priesthood, partakers of priesthood. Richard? I was just thinking, we talked at the beginning of this discussion about the opening verses, about the concept of building Zion and gathering and so on, and I'm impressed with the idea that the Oath and Covenant is really a, just a continuation of that discussion. Uh, back in verse 6, the Lord said that his city would be built by the sons of Moses, and then he uh, breaks off right there in a sense into a parenthetical discussion uh, about the history of the uh, Moses and his priesthood. And then back in verse 31, he said, now as I was saying before about the sons of Moses, whose sons ye are, and then uh, uh, 
Matt in verse 33, we're uh, talking about how it is we become the sons of Moses and of Aaron. And, and uh, just the, the great uh, opportunities through the oath and covenant of the priesthood. Beautiful. Here's a thought along this uh, oath and covenant of the priesthood. The idea says in verse 34, and they, meaning those who take upon the priesthood and its covenants and ordinances and go to the temple to find them, they become sons of Moses. Now, a, a yes. son, my son receives all that I have. I want to give them everything that I have, all my knowledge, all my experience, everything I want to give to him. And so the idea that to become a son of God or a son of Moses, of Aaron, the seed of Abraham, uh, the new and everlasting covenant, the church and the kingdom, the elect of God. I want my children to become elect. God, we are his children. He wants us to become elect. He wants to give us all that he has. When you say son of Moses and of Aaron, then the seed of Abraham, that's just another way of saying the sons and daughters of uh, right. Abraham. We have all that he was promised. The Abrahamic covenant. That's right. We can take that on one level, uh, maybe a, a, even a little bit deeper level. Moses uh, was a prophet. Uh, so as, they, as we accept the Melchizedek priesthood and have power therein and are sanctified, we literally are given the power to become a prophet to those over whom we have responsibility. Exactly. A priest, to someone who can minister to the spiritual and the temporal needs of the people. Uh, Abraham, a patriarch. And we have as much right to give patriarchal blessings to our wives and our children as does a state patriarch, except that we don't declare lineage and we don't store it in Salt Lake City. Right. And but it was Moses who said, I would that all my children were prophets. Yeah. Yeah. Would to in God. That sense. Would to God. Yeah, isn't yeah. that nice? One of the things I think is interesting as we move through this, um, we were talking about the hard-heartedness, uh, referring to Moses' time. Um, look what happens here after we go through verses 33 and 34, and then we start in verse 35. There's a wonderful sequence of here of, of yeah. receiving, but and I love that word. Um, as a matter of fact, it, I, I guess it hit me so strongly one time, I marked it separately. And also, verse 35, all they who receive this priesthood receive me, saith the Lord. For he that receiveth my servants receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth my father, and he that receiveth my father receiveth my father's kingdom. Therefore, all that my father hath um, um, shall be given unto him. That's to verse 38. But this is a notion you don't take it. This is There's a humility here where we become receptacles, where we will receive it under the guise of which it has been given. There's, does that make sense? This wonderful, awesome power, but we will receive priesthood and be humble in our service, and therefore we receive the Savior, and we receive the Father. What, what an interesting almost, turn. It's almost like the Father is offering us a huge electrical conduit that he says, plug this in the right circuit, light up your life, your wife, your children, and everybody that you preside, preside over. But if you abuse that, if you, well, in fact, that's what he says in verse 41, but whoso breaketh this covenant, after he hath received it, you plug it in the wrong circuit, it will destroy you. But there is a requirement. No doubt. That when he wants to give this to us, there is a requirement. Verse 33, for whosoever is faithful, yeah. mm -hmm. who seeks it, you know, to, to obtain unto these two priesthoods, which I have given, and magnifying thy con. Verse, what yeah. is the calling that he's given us? To become like him. That's right. And, and so when we get a little bit later, this notion of wielding the priesthood is not something we wield as with a sword. There is something that is very humbling. There is a requirement. There is accountability. There is fabulous blessing. And, and so we come down in verse 39, according to the oath and the covenant, there's that covenant again, the word. which mm -hmm. belongeth to the priesthood. Therefore, all who receive the priesthood, it seems to be according to the stipulation starting in verse 33, mm -hmm and receive this oath and the covenant. I, I've often wondered about that. The, the typical definition of a covenant is a two-way promise. And so some, some individuals look and say, gee, this is repetitive, oath and oath, or promise and promise, what's going on? And I, I remember reading once from Elder McConkey where he talked about the, the concept of an oath being that the oath is that which is sworn by God to man. And then the covenant coming, now will you receive Will you live to your obligation, your accountability, and then the promise comes again? What a, what a powerful concept. Absolutely. And he is bound if we do what he says. In, in that verse you're talking about, with, with regards to your oath and covenant uh, concept, verse 39, the antecedent is really important. And this right. is according to the oath. What's this? This is according to the oath and the covenant. That's the antecedent. It's the verse right up in front of it. It is, all my father has 
hath shall be given you. Well, what does all the Father have? Everything. <laughs> Exaltation. Exaltation. All power. Power. Knowledge. Kingdoms. Knowledge. Principalities. Everything. It's, it's, uh, it's DNC 130, you know, all covenants, commandments, bonds, contracts. All that he has is, is for us to receive. Where do we receive it? In the temple. Good point. We have so much to cover in Section 84. Before we leave Section 84, any other thoughts that we ought to bring out just really quickly? Just, uh, really a close, intimate relationship between us and our Lord. Uh, verse 77, he calls us his friends. Oh, yes. Verse 80, he said that nothing as minor as a hair falling from our heads would be unnoticed by him. Verse 85, he promises that in the very hour we need what uh, words they will be given us. Verse 88, uh, he will go uh, before us and be in uh, his angels on our right and left. And it just uh, sounds like we're on the same team with him. Verse 87, <laughs> what a team. I send you yes. out, of, out to reprove the world and all their uh, unrighteous deeds. So we have a, a responsibility as well when we have this yes. covenant. Good point. Randy, and, and closing I'm, thought? I was going to say uh, there that, that he's saying in the 40s here, 43, and he said, beware concerning yourself. Start watching out for yourself. Don't expect mom and dad to watch out for you or your priesthood leaders or the honor code or whatever. You know. And then if you will really, really respond to the Spirit, the Spirit will guide you and in a very personal way to the Father, and the Father will teach you of these covenants. And he says, you can tell when a person's under the bondage of sin because they don't come unto me. They That's don't right. come unto the mm -hmm. Father. Well, let's look at verse 85, as was mentioned, is treasure this up in your minds continually. And perhaps that's a good note to look at, is there's so to much to treasure. And, and then when one treasures mm -hmm. that up thoughtfully, I, I've often thought about this in verse 98, it says, and then you lift your voice together and sing this new song. And it seems that there are the verses there about Zion. And what a beautiful song yes, when we is. treasure and think this through. And so... You know, well, the, I, I guess we had the music for yeah, it. Yeah, there we have. There we go. I guess we have plenty here to 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 think about. Let's look at uh, section 85 and and uh, go to section 85, dealing with Bishop uh, Partridge, and we're looking at the latter part of 1832. We are in the setting of Kirtland again. Um, thoughts on this one to to frame it contextually on um, section 85, Craig. Well, you've got. Uh uh, you've got a situation going on down in Jackson County, Missouri, uh, that there's been a letter. This is an e excerpt from a letter from W.W. W. Feltz uh, talking about some concerns of administering law of consecration. And it has to do with Edward Partridge. And so that's what the Lord's addressing here now. Or this letter is an ex this is This revelation is an extract from a letter from W.W. W. Feltz regarding these concerns. Yeah, and, and the, I guess it is concerning, and so Joseph receives this revelation, and then um, one of my favorite parts on this is um, we see something similar to what we've talked about with the First Presidency, is fulfilling responsibility. If you don't, you shall be removed. The language here is, is really quite strong, um, as far as that might be, and we see a concept in verse 8. While that man who was called and appointed put forth his hand to steady the ark. Seems there's this notion of steadying the ark, which right. was one of the issues that's, that was coming from W.W. W. Phelps. Right. That's what he's saying to Bishop Partridge. You know, what are you doing? We don't ever know what that is. The Lord's concerned and says, if you steady the ark, then what am I going to do? I'll remove you. You know. uh, that's, that's right, and there has been precedence of that, so, so I guess Edward would take that into consideration perhaps. Richard? Well, he promised to send one mighty and strong, and uh, some apostate leaders over the <laughs> decades have said, I'm here, I'm the one mighty and strong, and in 1907, the first presidency had to remind us that the Lord uh, yes. said that this was in reference to the bishop in Missouri, not to the first presidency, plus, we read right here in section 85 that uh, and we know that uh, Brother uh, Partridge did repent and so the one mighty and strong was not needed. You know, that's one of my favorite parts of this whole section is, is you see the strong language coming forth and, and a good reference for this is in History of the Church in Volume 2 where it talks about Edward Partridge receiving this and the humility of the man to, is it I, Lord, and changing his ways. And so you don't see the replacement, but there's a beautiful line in there that's not explicit in this language here within the revelation of a man who does repent yes. and serves faithfully. Verse 6 says it, He's, uh, Yea, thus saith the still small voice which whispereth through the piercings of all things. He's been pierced. I yeah. mean, mm -hmm. uh, in his heart, he knows he's done wrong and... Uh, W.W. W. Phelps is, is helping us to see that. Let's look at section 86. Uh, uh, section 86, um, 
really has great reference to um, Matthew chapter 13 with the parable of the wheat and the tares. Um, Richard, anything to mention here? You might say, in effect, that this uh, applies that uh, parable to the latter days. In uh, the original, uh, the Lord was the sower of the seed. Here, the servants are. And, but uh, I, I, I relate it to uh, uh, teaching in the book of Revelation where there are angels who are anxious to reap down destruction on the wicked. But in effect here, we read the, the Lord is saying, well, we'll hold those angels back until people have a chance to receive the gospel and to understand it and to live it. Then, if they don't, then they are subject to that. And I know President Wilfred Woodruff talked about those angels being uh, released and so on. And that was in 1894. That's right. That. that was 50 years later, nearly. Well, but, the concept of tares is so interesting because it parallels so so well the, the wheat. You don't know which in the early stages which is the bad, which, which, which is the good. That's but right. you're there to grow together in this dispensation and we're to allow them. And so we need to be ever careful that there are wolves amongst the flock. We need to be able to sort them out and see who they are. And, uh, but at the same time, not haste to judgment. That's right. Oh, uh, once again, that wonderful invitation. Last but not least, we're out of time, but let's take a quick look at section 87. Uh, given in December of 1832, I'll have to be honest with you, um, one of my favorite parts of Section 87 is knowing the link that it has with Section 88 of a time of turmoil, a prophecy here dealing with war. Typically, most look at this as a prophecy of the Civil War, but that is only a foundational, and, and then it goes on to, it. yeah, that's right, and it goes on to other wars. Um, any comments on this just quickly? Probably as much as anything else because we live in the very environment when peace has been taken from the earth and the war is, is in all nations is the Lord's injunction to us in verse 8, Wherefore, stand ye in holy places and de be not moved until the day of the Lord come. And mm -hmm. then, for behold, it cometh quickly. And we can make wherever we are a holy place by just the kind of people we are. Isn't whether, the truth? Whether we be at war uh, any place, we can make that place a holy place, have a sacrament meeting while we're in times of war. Power yes. of priesthood with us, the yes. spirit enlightening us, all the wonderful things that we've talked about. And what a wonderful way to end on this one is with the admonition that we ourselves and others learn to stand upon those things that we learn through the revealed words and, and not move to or fro from those which have been given. Uh, thank you for your help in understanding these principles. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank you. Visit our website to find out more about the Doctrine and Covenants. Go to byubroadcasting.org. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.